Welcome to SB Talks. It is a smoky Tuesday, September 12th here in Sydney, and I am joined once again by our Chief Investment Officer, Nick Ryder. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Vinny. So, Nick, we are going to start closer to home uh, this week, if we can. We've had Australian GDP data through in the last week, and um, fair to say it's showing a, a broader trend of slowing growth, um, and your per, per capita recession is, is coming to play. Yeah, that's right. We got the June quarter um, national accounts, which showed GDP grew uh, 2.1% in the uh, year to the end of June, uh, up 0.4% for the quarter, and that was the same growth as the March quarter. Um, that was a little bit better than uh, the economists had been expecting uh, due to the upgrades to the March quarter data. Um, and uh, I guess it was a little bit ahead of where the RBA had been forecasting the economy to, to be at. So when you, when you begin to strip it back and get away from that headline figure and dig further into the weeds, what trends are we seeing? Yeah, so as you mentioned, it was um, a per capita recession. So we've now had two quarters of negative growth, GDP growth on a per person basis. So the economy uh, grew 2.1% over the year. Yeah, so um, just for the benefit of the listeners there, we are seeing, I guess, population growth as a, as a bit of this migration catch-up play post-COVID is, is coming through. The, the economy is not growing in line with the population growth. That's right. So the, the population grew 2.5% and the economy grew 2.1%. Right. So that's on a, on a per-person basis. Mm. We, we all went backwards, which, which is disappointing. Um, and that's happened for the last two quarters. Um, underneath the headline data, um, consumer spending was, was pretty soft uh, and dwelling investment also pretty soft. So, you know, we had a strong export number that contributed 0.8%. To, to GDP growth over the quarter, um, but yeah, the the underlying data, what we would call you know domestic demand, was was pretty subdued. Mm. So I guess comfort there for the RBA that their policies are starting to have an impact. And Governor Lowe made his final address as he now transitions out of the role. And uh, new Governor Michelle Bullock coming into play. No great surprise that he didn't have anything uh, monumental to say on exit. No, I think there was a little bit of a discussion about his, you know, his achievements, uh, where he might have got a few things wrong, um, how some of his comments were maybe misinterpreted by the media uh, and latched on to. Mm. Uh, and I guess there was, um, there was some subtle signals to government on some of the sort of longer term structural issues facing the economy. So productivity being one of them. So we saw with the national accounts data, uh, productivity fell 2% over the quarter. Uh, and productivity is now back to March 2016 levels. So we've had no growth in productivity in Australia for the last seven years. Wow. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, you know, so the, the, the economy has expanded, but the number of workers and the hours worked uh, has expanded at a faster rate. And so GDP per hour worked, which mm-hmm. is how they measure productivity, has been very subdued. And I, I know you've talked about this before, Pro- measuring productivity is quite hard. It's quite hard to define in terms of the trends. But when you look at it over that time period and that data set, it, it's pretty stark, actually, that, that there has been a, this totally benign uh, productivity growth environment. That's right. And, and Governor Lowe in his speech last week said that if we want to improve our living standards, if we want wages to go up, we need productivity growth. You can't have... Uh, wages growing at you know three and a half to four percent, which is what they are at the moment, and productivity actually going backwards. That's costing businesses more, and it's not sustainable. So, and that, in, that, that was his call out, I think, to government to to try and work on some of those things. That, that you've got a serious situation here that we need to put some policy in place to try and and, re- and change this trend. Yeah. So we're in a data dependent environment. Uh, we are at four point one percent. Nothing in that data to indicate that we need to go up probably any further unless unless inflation begins to kick back through later in the year? Yeah, I think there's nothing that we've seen in the data recently that would suggest that the RBA needs to do more. As I said, the economy is sort of slowing. Um, you know, I think inflation is obviously still too high and, and perhaps we will see wages grow um, more strongly in the second half of the year after the Fair Work Commission decisions kicked in. 
Um, and also more recently, we've seen the oil price rise. So the oil price, you know, in in, in West Texas intermediate terms is up about 24% since mm. the end of June. And that'll start to flow th- back into fuel prices and things like that. So we could see headline inflation tick back up, which is, mm. is not particularly helpful. And our dollar hasn't been particularly strong either. So you can potentially have some import inflation there too. Well, that's right. Exactly. Our dollars tracked the Chinese yuan down and, uh, and you know, so that's inflationary as well for imported goods. Um, and the oil price, a lot of that oil price um, increase has been helped by Saudis and the Russians um, extending their production cuts of 1.3 million barrels a day to try and support the oil price. Mm. Obviously, the Russians need that to help fund the Ukraine conflict. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think all the listeners would very much feel that one every time they pull in now. It's uh, it's pretty impossible to fill up your tank for less than $100 anymore. It's uh, it, it definitely is having its impact. Might step across Stapeside. Uh, we've had a couple of data sets out there and a bit of a mixed message across the two. We've had U.S. services, ISM, and also non-farm payrolls. One, the market liked quite a bit more than the other. Yeah, so the non-farm payrolls data for August was was pretty good. It was pretty much in line with expectations, uh, about 187,000 jobs created over the month, um, which is, you know, well down on the three, four, five hundred thousand, you know, about six, 12 months ago. Mm-hmm. So the labour market coming back into better balance, the uh, participation rate, which was something that had been keeping the labour market tight, uh, actually lifted, so more people coming back into the workforce that maybe had exited around COVID, so that's good as well. And average hourly earnings uh, softened a little bit from 0.4% for the month down to 0.2%. Uh, so that brought the annual rate from 44 mm-hmm. to 43 So, you know, continuing that story that the labour market's sort of coming back into better balance, and I think we've spoken before about the JOLTS, the job opening survey that's showing fewer job openings. So that was encouraging. The market liked that. That sort of played into the theme that the RB, sorry, the Fed is is probably done. Probably done or close to being done, yep. Uh, but as you said, the ISM, uh, which is the measure of business activity in the services side of the US economy, uh, actually bounced back up. Um, it was easing, um, but it actually um, rose quite strongly from 52.7 to 54.5. And Importantly, the subcomponents that measure prices uh, and employment also bounce back strongly. So it really suggested that maybe there's, you know, some reacceleration in the services side of the US economy. And there has been this lingering when we talk about central banks potentially being done with interest rate increases. There has been this lingering fear that we get the second wave effect in, in inflation. So we're, we're probably talking about looking for signals that that could be coming. May perhaps share with the listeners just what that is and how it can occur. Yeah, so I think the biggest, well, obviously, you know, oil prices could be mm-hmm. another, could be one thing that drives a second inflation wave. So it's a big input cost into a lot of businesses. Um, yeah. Then there's, uh, we've mentioned before, the services side of the economy. Mm-hmm. If that remains strong, um, that pushes wages up and we get the wage price spiral potentially. And I think the third thing is if inflation actually kind of comes down, which it has been, but people's wages are still kind of going up, then people's real spending power actually improves. Uh, and if they've still got jobs, then you could get a second leg up in, in inflation, particularly services inflation, as, as people feel a bit wealthier um, and, uh, and their real spending power goes up. And when we think about this, I'd suggest that this is very much on central bankers' minds as well. So when they are considering not so much, well, Partially in terms of what further rate increases they need to make, but very much about when they start to decrease rates. And there had been that hope earlier this year that that might start in late 2023. Now that's been well and truly by all parties pushed off into a 2024 area, but it will be a factor to make them just go more gently on the decrease while they want to make sure that there are none of these sort of second wave lag inflationary things coming through the system. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Um, you know, and the, the, there's experience from the 1970s that showed that they, the Fed cut too early, too mm-hmm. soon, before the war on inflation was over, and then they did get that second inflation mm-hmm. uh, wave. So I think they'll be very cautious about cutting, uh, even if inflation is coming down. Uh, they want to wait until it's, you know, kind of within, 
you know, spitting distance of its two of the two percent target, I would think, before seeing substantial interest rate cuts. Mm. I'd like to speak uh, briefly about Japan, if we can, and their their monetary policy sort of led the world in this uh, zero interest rate, negative interest rate environment, the quantitative easing. Even they seem to be gradually backing away from these policies. Yeah, well, so they've had inflation above two percent for over twelve months now. Right. You know, and major cause for celebration. Yes, there. cause yeah. for celebration. And yeah. so the new, fairly new um, Bank of Japan Governor uh, Kazuo Ueda uh, gave a press interview over the weekend um, where he was quite hawkish. He was suggesting that um, the conditions might be right to potentially um, get away from negative interest rate policy and abandon the yield curve control mm-hmm. program, which targets the 10-year bond yield. So um, potentially, yield curve control program holding down those long-term bond deals. Yeah, well, you might recall they've been gradually widening the mm-hmm. band. So initially it was meant to be around zero and then they widened it to, I think it was 50 basis points and now it's been widened to potentially 1%. Um, so they've been gradually kind of backing away from the the zero target, um, but they might abandon it all to, altogether. But can they afford to do that in terms of their levels of, of government debt and uh, the cost of servicing that? I think they've been very cautious about doing it in a very gradual way. They don't want certainly the 10-year bond to go from 0.7, which is where it is today, to four, to yeah. four yeah. you know, because that would have significant impact on the valuation of a lot of bonds held by pension funds and banks, etc., within their own economy, within yeah, their own economy, major shock effects within yeah. their own economy. Uh, so I think they want to do it in an orderly fashion, um, and certainly this this uh, article over the weekend suggested that they're thinking about how to do that, and it could come as soon as next month, according to some commentators, or certainly by the end of the year. Very interesting indeed. Uh, The sands, they continue to keep moving. One more shout out for our listeners that we are finishing off our asset allocation review and we will be recording in the next week a special podcast to take you through uh, some of the high level findings and, and recommendations that are coming out of that process. So please stay tuned for that one. But for now, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you, listeners, and take care. Speak soon.